catch up or like just sync up with everybody else if you'd like to um, before we get going. But before that, there were a few topics that people brought up that are pretty interesting. And so I was just going to show some of the additional capabilities that we have in OpenMC that we don't have time to kind of experiment with ourselves or experiment with today. But um, yeah, so we have the ability, uh, the question was asked earlier, how do we connect to DAGMC, uh, which is a method for representing CAD-based geometry in Monte Carlo codes? So we have a whole notebook on this uh, with a lot of examples as part of the course that we do with the NEA. That's a four-day course, so we have a lot of time to dive into special topics like this. Um, but here we'll just do kind of an overview of the content and capabilities that are demonstrated in this notebook. So um, in this example, we just model a, a simple teapot like this, uh, which is relatively, it's a relatively simple object, but it's not something that we'd want to try to represent uh, given what we know already about how, how to do this in CSG. It would be very, very difficult to model in CSG. So uh, what we can do is if we have an existing DAGMC model, then we can import that and use it as a geometry in OpenMC. And the different volumes in the, or parts in the CAD model can be assigned different materials. So here we just filled our teapot with a little bit of water. Um, and then you can see the geometric detail that we can uh, kind of convey in OpenMC models using this geometry method. And we can execute these things uh, just like we would with tallies and anything else as we would do with CSG. So here's kind of a tally region that's like superimposed on top of the geometry. And we're gathering some information about uh, the scattering that's going on in the shell of the teapot as well as in the water. We can do this for a tokamak geometry as well. So for those of you who are more fusion inclined, uh, you can import CAD-based geometries that are um, tokamaks also. And one of the really powerful parts of how CAD-based geometry has been designed and implemented in OpenMC is that we can take pieces of this model and clip it with CSG planes. Uh, in a lot of codes, I think now that use DAGMC, either the entire model needs to be built with the native CSG geometry like we've done with the pincel, or it needs to be CAD. And in OpenMC, we can mix and match and combine those. So this example goes on to show that we can take a section of this and kind of make a quadrant of the tokamak model. So we're looking down from the top of the machine, and all the way around is this azimuthal symmetry around the poloidal direction of the fusion device. And then we can take that and make an additionally kind of clip it so that we just have the upper half of the machine. But then we can go on to combine that uh, later on. So we can kind of just cut the model uh, in this way. Let's see. Um, there were also questions about the nuclear data aspect of this. Oh, and I guess maybe, yeah, that's why I didn't see this stuff. Images. There were also questions about the um, nuclear data API with OpenMC. Um, so this is just showing some of the things that we've talked about already, the atomic masses that we store and the natural abundances for each element um, and isotope. And then uh, more information about how we can compute things like dose coefficients. So these are things that we store as part of the data module generally. Um, but then there's also our ability to kind of uh, determine decay photon energies, things like this. Uh, the incident neutron class is kind of where we handle reaction information. So we have an incident neutron and all the different possibilities, angle energy correlations and distributions that go along with those reactions as well. So it provides examples of how to interact with those at different temperature values for like the total cross section, how to plot cross sections relatively easy, easily, and things like that. So um, there's a whole set of examples of these at um, in one of the links that I provided in the slides. So do make sure you download those so you have those resources in the very last slide of that presentation because uh, a lot of this kind of information is available in that notebooks repository. The last one that came up a couple of times was whether or not we could plot in 3D. Um, we can do that. With a Python API, we get plots that look more like uh, this one that are just kind of an axis line slice through a reactor model. However, we do have the ability to do 3D plots in a couple of different ways. Um, one is voxel plotting. So this allows you to specify a width in X 
and Y, and then also in Z. And so essentially it's taking, it's doing a whole bunch of different slice plots at different um, axial levels of the geometry. And then you can export them. And if you do it in a high enough resolution, you can get pretty nice images. Um, however, it's not like the most efficient thing. This is storing a very large, what is essentially a very large mesh um, of the different cells contained in each voxel. Uh, recently, somebody, a student at MIT added the ability to do projection plots. So this is a lot like path tracing or volume rendering of our geometries in OpenMC. It's not the fastest thing in the world compared to other visualization tools that are like built for visualization, um, but it does give you the ability to add some opacity, to show outlines and things like that, and then make really nifty uh, GIFs like he did here for this. So I just wanted to touch on those few topics. Okay, good. So this is kind of where we left off um, last time, when, or right before we broke for lunch. So we did, hopefully, an OpenMC run, and I realized that we've got through a lot of material this morning, uh, and it's a lot to keep up with, so I just wanted to talk about how we could, how you can potentially sync up at this point and just start from where we are. Inside of the file browser, um, under the notebooks folder, there is, um, corresponding solutions to each of the tutorial sections. I'll try to make this a little bit larger. Um, so for the OpenMC tutorial, there's also an OpenMC solution notebook. And so I'll go ahead and open that. Um, and here we see it's that same notebook that we're working with. The narrative is all the same, but all of the information that we put in uh, going through it this morning together is already there and present. Um, and so if you would like, an easy way to sync up with where we are is to go to the section in the outline that shows running OpenMC. So again, I'll just kind of reiterate, if you go to the file browser under notebooks and OpenMC solution, you can open this notebook and then in the table of contents, if you click on running OpenMC, you can select this cell and then kind of as we discussed in the Jupyter Notebooks intro, you can sync up to where we're at right now just by saying restart kernel and run up to the selected cell. So if I do this, I see that all these cells above the one that I've currently selected have these stars, meaning that they're kind of waiting to execute and then eventually we'll get there. We'll execute and then we'll go down and we'll do execute our first OpenMC run just like we did in the, in the other notebook. So if you'd like, that's a nice way to kind of catch up to where we are. And then you can continue to follow along in, the, in this same notebook and have all the same information that we're working with. All right, let's see. Good. Cool. So, um, one thing, well, so I'll just pause there. Are there any questions about syncing up or kind of catching up? Are there any people who might just be like one or two steps away from getting where we are by following along this morning? Okay. All right. Sounds good. On we go. So, um, one thing that we kind of stepped past this morning before running our first OpenMC simulation was the temperature treatment. Um, sorry, just on another window here, trying to silence the notification on my machine. Okay, 
So uh, one thing that we kind of stepped past was temperature treatments. We did talk about this a little bit this morning, um, but how OpenMC handles temperatures that are a specific material because the underlying nuclear data, the cross-section, the true physical cross-section values are going to change depending on the temperature of the material. So there's two main ways that uh, OpenMC handles temperature treatment. So one is the nearest option, meaning that OpenMC will, if you specify a temperature on a material, OpenMC will load cross-section data as close as it can to that temperature, and then it will use that in simulation. There's another option that is to interpolate the temperature um, cross-section dependence, and it will do that by loading cross-sections at temperatures that bound the temperatures of the material and the problem and use the two closest ones, interpolating between the two. Um, so we already ran OpenMC, which is kind of neat because now we can just take a quick look at like what the effect of that is. Uh, so our, we'll just take note of our combined K effective, like 1.48241 here. We'll take a look at it again before we run. But what we can do is change the temperature of our materials in a pretty easy way using Python. So if we just said for M in materials, remembering that the materials is this material collection that we had um, earlier on in the morning. And then we can just say m dot temperature is equal to 523.15. And this temperature is going to be in Kelvin, to be clear. Now we'll also need to do, um, we'll also need to specify what temperature method we'd like to handle, how we'd like OpenMC to handle temperatures essentially on these materials. So if we do settings, we can say temperature. And there's a couple different settings that we can, uh, that we can set here. So one is just the method. Okay, so this is how we're gonna specify what methods use, whether it's interpolation or nearest. And we can just use this term nearest. And then we also will tell it the tolerance. So the tolerance temperature the tolerance specifies how far away the cross section the temperature for the cross section data can be from a given material temperature before OpenMC will not use it. So in this case we're going to set a relatively large uh, tolerance. Um, just to make sure that we can run the problem just fine, but typically you want that to be no larger than like how how off your cross how how approximate your cross sections will be in your simulation. So that's just something to keep in mind. So by setting these, we can go ahead and look at our materials. So if we just looked at the first material in our material collection, oh materials, I missed an S. And we'll see that the temperature has now been updated uh, from what it was, the default value being room temperature, uh, to 523.15 Kelvin. So then we'll want to export those new settings that we've applied, along with the new materials. So that way we're capturing the settings that we added here in our XML file and the new material temperatures also. And then we can go down to this cell and rerun OpenMC. So here we see the same output. But one thing that we can note is that the minimum neutron data temperature, which used to be 294 Kelvin in the previous run, is now 600 Kelvin, because that's the closest cross-section cross temperature that we have available for our materials. And then when we come down and run, we can see that our K-effective did in fact change considerably. Uh, let's see here. So there's a little section here on geometry plotting. This has a lot to do excuse with. Excuse me, excuse me. Oh yeah. In, just in between. So you, you change temperature, but you don't change dimensions, of course, because 
Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's so a good point. Usually you need like to this calculate reactivity coefficients, for example, you, with temperature, also all dimensions are changed. Is there any way to do it in automatic? No, there's, there's no way to do that automatically, but that's a good point. Vladimir was saying that if we were to change the temperature of a model, there's likely going to be some changes in the geometry as well. And so if we were to model a reactor at zero power versus full power, then we would want to account for that. Um, and changes the geometry accordingly. That's a good point. But there's no way to automatically do it in OpenMC at this point in time. Yeah. Um, let's see. There's a section here on geometry plotting. Um, this, I think, probably more important to capture at this point is how we interact with OpenMC in the command line. Um, so I'm going to talk about that for a little bit. But this is about how to generate plots. Um, and this is available in the solutions notebook also. But this is about how to create objects that will, where you can generate plots using the OpenMC executable rather than do it from the Python notebook. Uh, so if you were doing that as part of like a full analysis and you had like a script that ran OpenMC in plotting mode and then ran it in criticality mode, um, it will read plots from the XML file and generate images for you in the, in the terminal. Uh, I think we have bigger fish to fry today, um, so I'll leave that to you to discover in the solutions notebook and just talk a little bit about how we interact with OpenMC in a terminal. So this is something also that's really nice about these notebooks is I, I went to this file menu and then went down to new and you can create a terminal here and interact with the Amazon machine as if you were in a shell uh, for those familiar with Linux. So I'm inside of this folder where we have all the workshop content. Uh, so cor that corresponds to the same set of files that we've been using in the Explorer here. And in our notebooks, I can look and see what's in here. So in the OpenMC tutorial folder, I'll change directory into that. You can see a number of different files, all the same ones that we see here on the left. And so we have our materials XML, our settings XML, and geometry XML. Um, I mentioned also that when we imported OpenMC, it determined the, cross, the path to the cross-section data from an environment variable. And I can ask the terminal to display that to screen. So if I ask it to echo this environment variable, you don't need to follow along with this part, by the way. I just want to kind of demonstrate it. But if I echo this environment variable to screen, then we see it matches the one that we saw in the notebook. And... Additionally, we can also run OpenMC from here. So I'll just run it with the help flag. So it gives us all these different options. I'm calling the OpenMC compiled executable as opposed to running it from Python like we were before. And here we can see all the different options and run modes that we have available in OpenMC. So if we want to do something like, let's say, run OpenMC, um, and we're just going to run it with two threads instead of four, um, so we're going to be running with kind of half the computational power we were running before. We'll execute that, and we'll get all the same output that we were looking at in the Python notebook. So this is more common to how you would execute OpenMC. If you were like a developer like me, um, or aspire to be a developer in the future, we're always welcoming new people. And also, if you were to run this on an HPC system, this is much more how you would probably operate in terms of executing OpenMC. So here we can see that this option that we passed, dash s, and then the number of threads that we want to run with uh, did actually affect our simulation because now we're running with two cores um, on the Amazon machine. And off we go running our simulation. And it produced the same. Excuse me, Patrick. How yeah. did you get this to console? Because the uh, ticket to the terminal. What is file? Oh. oh, yeah, it was in fi uh, the file menu. Uh -huh. And then under new. If you click on terminal, the uh, third, ter third terminal, item not console. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, and we we produce the same k effective value that we did in our notebook. Okay. So. We've talked about um, kind of initially just general Monte Carlo problems set up where we had materials, geometry, and settings. Um, and then we interacted with a corresponding object in OpenMC 
generated input files, and then we ran our first simulation. There is a class in OpenMC that kind of ties all this together and sort of streamlines model development. Um, the reason we don't start with that is we do like to break the problem down, like problem setup down into these different components uh, before we introduce this class. But there's a class that's called the model class in OpenMC. And it can tie all of these things together. Um, so we can provide it with a settings. Uh, well, let's do it like this. So we'll set it, um, we'll just create one and then we'll set the settings to the one that we have in our current environment. The geometry to the geometry object and the material, dot, materials to the material, materials collection that we had before. And so now one really convenient thing about this class is without having to export anything um, and without having to, yeah, without having to export anything and then call run, we can do that all in one step. And one uh, really beneficial byproduct of this path to running OpenMC is that it produces the path to the output file at the end. So in Python, it's really convenient because I can say, give me the state point file or the output file from doing a model.run. And so if we do that, we see we're gonna run OpenMC again with this same problem. And then at the end of that, we then get this information that is the state point file on our system. And so we can just take that and run with it now as we move on to looking at how to extract information from an OpenMC simulation, which we're gonna start talking about soon. Um, one thing I wanted to note is that we produced three different XML files originally, and when we did model.run, it produced a single model XML file. And what that contains is Essentially, these other three XML files all put into one, into one file. Um, and I just wanted to note that if you're doing this, that the model.xml file is going to be preferred over the separate XML file. So when you're executing OpenMC, um, it's going to use that model.xml to get the whole set of information it needs to run the simulation, rather than using any of these individual XML files, if that's present in the directory. And we do see a warning to that effect um, so we see a warning saying, hey, there's other model, or there's other XML files here, but we're gonna use the model XML just to like, make sure that there isn't an error in uh, where information is expected to be. Is there something you want? Yeah, there's a question about the bound up calculation in OpenMC. Uh -huh. It's a side question, but um, yeah, the result gives the burn up as a function of energy or do they have to uh, do a normalization? Um, so those are those are sort of two separate questions, I think. So one uh, gives the we're not doing burn up calculations here. You can do those with OpenMC, uh, and you would require some kind of power input for such a calculation. Um, so so for the first one, we're not really doing burn up, I suppose. Uh, and then what's the second piece? Oh, right, right, the normalization, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna talk about that really soon. So that's a very timely question. Uh, thank you for asking it. All the information, well, all the tallies that we are gonna look at in a little bit, we'll kind of explore normalization. So we'll just go forward with that. But. Um, okay, so moving on, we're gonna to start to talk about how to produce customized information from our OpenMC simulation. Oh, it's a weird artifact that I'm seeing on my screen. Uh, so we're gonna look at how to apply what we call filters in OpenMC. So in OpenMC, we like, essentially what we're computing is an angular flux uh, as we simulate particles and we're converging that over time. And so based on that angular flux, meaning particles are moving in any given direction uh, from, a from a given position and, and at a certain energy, we can take that information as we generate that field and filter it to get specific information that we want. And we can filter that information down in a number of ways. And this is kind of philosophically how we approach tallies in OpenMC. Uh, we can filter it by 
score, meaning that this score might filter information out for only a specific reaction type, like if we wanted to look at only fission reactions. We can filter that out by angle, so if we wanted to look at particles only moving through a region at a certain angle, um, or into a region at a certain angle, like if we're computing multi-group cross-sections or something like that. Uh, we can also filter it based on spatial information. So if we only wanted to tally information for a certain cell, then we would filter based on that cell. Uh, and we can combine these things in a pretty flexible system to get the specific information we want from our simulation. Plus. Okay, so first we're just going to import a couple of other modules that are pretty much ubiquitous to, um, to scientific computing with Python. So one is NumPy, uh, which is a numerics, um, well it's really like a, yeah, it's like a, it's like a matrix representation library that allows you to kind of store information with an arbitrary set of dimensions and all this stuff. But, uh, it's really useful because it allows you to specify specific data types. Um, so we'll use that from time to time here. And then for visualization, we're going to be importing matplotlib. And specifically, we're going to be importing the pyplot module. And then we're just going to give it a different name to shorten it up a little bit. This is a pretty common, uh, almost what I call idiom, in in Python scripts that you'll see for scientific work. Okay, so going forward, we're going to continue to work with our model. And just to remind ourselves a little bit about what that model contains, we can look at things like the geometry, that geometry's root universe as well. And so just like we looked at when we ran this model before lunch, we have these cells in it. And then from the model, we can also, the model geometry, we can do things like ask it to go through and get all the materials in that model. So just kind of a refresher on what we're dealing with And we can plot that universe as well. Oh, model geometry. Okay, so now that we have kind of a refresher on the different materials um, in our model, what the geometry looks like, we're just gonna work on um, a few different things for generating tallies in OpenMC and extracting specific information. So one is we're going to determine the energy or heat produced from uh, each fission event. And then we're gonna look at the flux spectrum of the pin cell. And then finally, we're gonna do some plotting of reaction types based on material, depending on time here. So first, we're gonna work on energy release per fission. Um, so the important thing to know here is the, or to, have in mind is the different types of scores that OpenMC can filter by. So the scores are um, things like the new fission or the number of neutrons produced per fission event, uh, the elastic scattering that occurs, so it'll filter only elastic scattering events or general scatter scattering events, and there's a whole list of different interactions. Uh, if you're really familiar with Monte Carlo and you're thinking of MT reaction types, which are just identifiers for a specific reaction, OpenMC can take those in place of any of these scores as well. Um, so here in this section, we have scores that are kind of based on energy, uh, meaning that we're going to be looking at the energy produced by a fission event and scoring that. So when we ask for that in a tally, We'll be accumulating that information in the simulation. Um, so there's a few of note that I just wanted to talk about. So one is just heating. So this is just general heating uh, from neutron fission. Um, and this does not include the energy produced from gammas as a result of this 
uh, fission event. There is also heating local, which means that the heating, uh, it includes the heating from the fission event itself and the neutron energies coming out, but also includes the photon energies as though they were deposited locally. So that's the local kind of part of it. Um, and I mention that because they're often confused, but the descriptions are here in the future if you need it. And then we also have the kappa fission, which is just the pure, um, it's the pure Q value of the reaction overall. So the total kinetic energy released back into the problem. And this is uh, probably the most common one that you'll see used overall. So the first thing we're gonna do is go ahead and create a tally. We'll print that tally to screen. So we see that tallies are another set of objects in OpenMC that contain IDs. Uh, they're gonna have filters. So filters and scores, just to distinguish between those two, scores are typically something like a reaction type or a property of a reaction that we're accumulating and tallying. Whereas filters are more like, we want information only in this cell or information only from particles going in a certain direction um, or in a certain energy range. So kind of filters are more about phase space and scores are a little bit more about the reactions themselves. We can also tally, we won't be doing this today, but we can also tally specifically for reactions from uh, a particular nuclide if we want to also. So that's really useful for like um, burn off calculations and things like that. All right, let's see. So for this tally, we're gonna need just a couple of scores to accomplish this task. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is I'll go up here. I'll say tally scores. And we can just provide this attribute um, to the tally object and the set of scores by name that we want to tally. So here we're gonna be tallying a fission rate. So this is gonna give us the number of uh, fission events per source particle in the simulation, and we'll talk a little bit about the normalization aspect of that in a little bit. And then the Q value per source particle, particle or the kappa fission value. All right, and then we can look to kind of ensure ourselves that those were in fact added to the tally object. All right, and then, um, Using this model class is really handy because adding these tallies to the simulation is really just as simple as saying model.tallies and then provide that attribute with a tallies collection object. And the, the tallies collection object is very similar to the one that we use for materials, so we just can provide it openmc.tallies and then that tally. And now that we've done that, we can just run our simulation. And again, I'll capture that state point file for use later. So we'll let that run, it shouldn't take too long. All right. And now we'll notice something uh, a little bit different about the final state of our simulation. If we look at the file explorer um, on the left-hand side here, there was just a new file, it's called tallies.out. This did not appear before because we didn't have any custom or user-specified tallies as part of OpenMC. So if we open this file, we see that we have uh, kind of a summary of information about the tally. So we have tally one, um, and we see that there are no other filters applied here, but that it tallied the fission rate and then the kappa fission rate as well. Okay, so the tally results, which we can visualize here as well. Um, this tallies.out file is a nice way to look at like a summary of tallies but it's not the best way to interact with this data. If we wanted to get this information and then start to use it in Python, we don't wanna to have to parse through a text-based file uh, to get that information out. 
which is exactly what the state point file is for. Um, so we'll look at how to get our tally information out of the state point file next. So we're gonna provide this um, line of code and what this is doing is it's gonna say with openmc.statePointFile as SP and then any of the code inside of this block, any of the indented code inside of this block is gonna access this object, this state point file object and when we leave that indented block of code, um, that state point file is gonna be closed up. So what the state point file is, is it's really an HDF5 file containing a whole bunch of binary data from the simulation. And we provide this Python API so it's a lot easier to access and process with. Um, so this, this line here just kind of opens it up. This is very much so equivalent to doing something like sp equals openmc dot state point, state point file. So I've just executed that and then extract tally information, and then running sp.close. But this is a, a much more, how do I say, uh, foolproof way of doing this in Python, because if anything goes wrong inside of this block, the state point file will still be closed up afterward. Okay, so a little bit on how to get your tally information out of this state point file. We know that our tally ID is one, and so we probably could look it up um, that way, but a more robust way to do it is by using the get tally feature of the state point object. And so we'll use our helper function just to examine what that provides to us and what that functionality is. So the get tally object will look up a tally based on a whole bunch of different properties of this tally that we can provide. So we can say we could look it up by its scores, by the filters we've applied, and more simple information like its name or its ID. So we'll just kind of experiment with doing a little bit of each of those. And so we'll say this tally, we can get the, oh, we're gonna get it by scores here. So we'll say the tally scores for the tally that we wanna extract from the state, oh, sorry, state point file, uh, the scores are gonna be fission and kappa fission. And then if we wanna get this tally by ID, we can do that equivalently just by saying, give me the tally based on its ID instead. And then if we print tally by scores, we'll see that this is our original tally, um, but it has a whole bunch of data associated with it now, which is what we want. And similarly, the object that was returned from this call, getting the tally, but specifying the ID, it comes back and it's the same thing also. So just two different ways of doing, of extracting that information. All right, let's see. Okay, so uh, yeah, as I mentioned, kind of a quick aside on how we interact with these HDF5 binary files. Um, if you open them this way, and then try to run, like if I were to do, let's see. If I were to do this and then try to run a subsequent OpenMC simulation, one kind of um, pitfall that we find with open, like with this in workflows is that the files, the HDF5 files are still open in the file system. And so when OpenMC goes to run a new simulation and write a new summary file or a new state point file, um, it's gonna run into an error because it's basically saying like when you open this file here, it's locked it out of writing a new file. And so that's why we kind of hammered home this point about always making sure that you run uh, this close command or 
extract information inside of a block like this. Okay, back to, back to tallies. So um, to get the energy released per fission event, it's relatively easy um, in terms of the units that we have here. So the units that we have, if I can show our meeting, yeah, yeah, hide the meeting stuff and then look at the scores. So this score, um, the kappa fission, units are gonna be in EV per source particle. All right, and so we're, what we're looking to get in the end is just determining like the, uh, the MEV per fission event. So here it's telling us this is how much energy is released per source particle. And then if we look at the fission reaction, where'd you go? The fission reaction is just a reaction rate in units of reactions per source particle. So, can I chalk for this? Yeah, the fission rate, okay, and that's gonna be in source particle and then we have the kappa it's going to be an EV for a source particle okay and so if we take our kappa our kappa fission value and divide it by the fission rate then what we're going to get in the end electron volts per fission event in the simulation. So in this case, determining the energy per fission in our simulation uh, really doesn't require us to know a source rate. It's more a physical property of the materials, so that kind of makes sense. It doesn't matter how frequently it's happening, just that it happens often enough, we get a good estimate of it. So a little bit on how to extract that information now. We have the tally objects. And we can look at the information that is associated with those. Oh, this is tally. Let's see, tally by ID. And we can see the mean values here. So corresponding to our tally, uh, our tallies.out file, we have two values. One, the first one is going to be the uh, fission rate, and the second one is going to be the cap of fission or energy release per fission. Now, looking at them through the mean is possible, um, especially for this tally, but as more and more values accumulate, it can be difficult to know what values we're really looking at. And that's where this tallies.getValues um, command comes in. So this will extract information from a tally object based on a whole bunch of different information, the scores, the filters, the nuclides, et cetera, et cetera. So on our tally by ID, we can get the fission rate by calling get values and then specifying that the scores we want is just this fission score. Oh, whoops, I need to make sure I say scores is equal to that so I'm telling it this is the type of score that I wanna get information for. And then I can print the information that comes out of that. So one thing we'll do, if we notice it's kind of nested in this data structure, and if we look at the type of this, it's really an array, it's a NumPy array. Um, so it's kind of nested in this data structure and we want to get it out of there. So what we'll do is we can just flatten out this array and get the first value. So if we do that, then we just get a fission rate and we get a raw value instead of it being kind of tucked away in this array. We do that for good reason because as tallies get more and more complicated, you do want to be able to slice through that data array more effectively. So we can do the same thing for the cap of fission. We can say tally by ID, get values, scores. And instead here of using fission, we're gonna do kappa fission. And same thing, this is kind of just managing the array information that we get out. We're gonna flatten out that array and take the first value. And now, 
we should be able to print some information. So if we, let's see, uh, I'm going to say this is our fission rate. Vision per source particle. That rate is cap of fission. And finally, as we talked about here, we'll say this is our MEV per fission. So that's going to be our kappa fission divided by, well, we'll do this in a separate line. So we'll say MEV per fission is equal to kappa fission divided by fission. And we'll multiply it by a uh, factor of 1e to the minus 6, so that we get MEV per fission. And I guess the units are kind of self-explanatory there. All right, so we see we have our fission rate, our kappa fission, and then as we expect for a system that's fueled with uranium, we have something that's around 195 to 200 MEV. We're missing a little bit of energy there for photon deposition. So realistically, I think it would be a little bit closer to 200, um, but we're also in a fast range, uh, in a fast reactor, so. Yeah. Question. Question. Um, the how to obtain the spa spatial distribution of flux per uh, fission reaction and... Uh, how many, uh, how to obtain the spatial distribution of flux for fission reaction over, I don't know, an R, R. What is the, uh, yeah, yeah. the reaction rate? Ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Spatial distribution of flux or the fission rate and the reaction rate. Um, so the question was, uh, the question online was how do we attain the spatial distribution for flux or the fission rate or any kind of reaction rate, really? Um, we can do that in a number of different ways. We'll look at how to tally information by material in a little bit, but if you want a really fine spatial distribution of that, you can also use mesh tallies as well. And there are one more question about mm -hmm. the depletion calculations. How many cross-section groups does the burn absorber use to perform burn-up calculation after the eigenvalue calculations by OpenMC is finished? So the, there's a couple of different ways to do burn-up calculations in OpenMC. So one is when you, when you do burn-up calculations with reaction rates instead of flux, you can get a, a reaction rate that's integrated across a continuous energy spectrum. So by default in OpenMC, you can, we'll use reaction rates. So there's really no cross-section groups to, to use in that case. However, if you are doing a burn-up calculation using flux, you can specify an arbitrary energy group structure to OpenMC to tally that flux and then apply it in burn-up where it will collapse that flux into a reaction rate um, within the module. All right. I hope that was, I hope that answered that question. Okay, so uh, task one. So we kind of uh, accomplished what we were looking to do there. Um, we got our MEV provision, and now we'll go ahead and look at plotting the neutron flux spectrum. Also, what is our index? Oh, great. Okay. So, uh, with regard to the neutron flux spectrum, we're going to need to do a slightly different tally um, with a little more complexity to it. So to get the flux spectrum, we're going to need a group structure. So the question in the chat was kind of timely in that sense. OpenMC provides a, um, a bunch of different group structures, particularly as part of the multi-group cross-section module. We can take a, the, a look at the name of those. So here we see um, a whole bunch of group structures that we could use, 
and then the keys for that, meaning that I could access these group structures by provide, by indexing into this and providing the, the name of one of these as a string. So for example, we're gonna be using the CASMO 70 group structure, and this is how I would access that information, is to index into that group structure data structure by just providing the name of the structure that I wanna use. So we'll call this CASMO 70. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and set up a energy filter using this group structure. So an energy filter is gonna filter our tally results into different energy bins. And so we're gonna say, our in, and maybe we should just take a look. Yeah, we'll do the energy filter. It's gonna be OpenMC energy filter, and then we can just provide it the groups that we wanna use here. So that would be the CASMO 70 group structure. And then we can kind of inspect this object. And just to ensure ourselves that it has the correct number of energy groups, we can do something like look at the bins. So we can say length of the energy filter. So how many bins, meaning how many groups have we divided the energy space into? And we'll see here that yes, in fact, it's a 70 group energy structure and we have 70 bins in our energy filter. And we'll see a little bit more what those look like in a more intuitive way when we go to plot this flux spectrum. So now that we have a filter, we're gonna go ahead and apply it to a tally. So the new tally we're gonna create is just openmc.tally. Uh, let's call it the flux tally, just so we don't clash with the one we did before. Um, let's see, so the flux tally is gonna need to have the filter we just created. And we're gonna provide that as part of a list. So our 70 group energy filter. Oops, flux, the flux tally. Scores is gonna be set to flux. And I think that should do it. So let's take a look at what's in that tally object. And so we'll see here, we've created a tally. We didn't provide it an ID, but it assigned two because we've already created one tally so far. It has one filter, it's an energy filter, and it's gonna be scoring the flux. So now we can apply this tally really easily just by saying model.tallies. OpenMC.tallies as the flux tally. And we're gonna capture that state point file still and run our model. So during the calculation, there are two questions from the chat. Um, First one is, is it possible to calculate the dose from the neutron flux? From the, from the neutron, neutron flux? flux. Yeah, yeah. So the there, neutron uh, in the openmc.data module, there are dose coefficients. So once you've produced a flux, you should be able to convolve that uh, energy, base, energy group based flux with these dose coefficients to get the dose values that you need. Is there another one? Yeah, the second one is if we want to have a group structure which is not present in the default list, say ABBN, mm -hmm. like, how can we do so? Like, yeah, that's you know, a good question. Defining the group structure manually. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. We used one that was predefined in OpenMC just to like make things easier. We'll actually use one that's not in OpenMC later on, but um, we'll just say temporary temp. So if we were going to want to do something like that, 
then what we would just provide to the energy filter is the, um, the boundaries of the energy bin. So let's say we wanted one, just a two group structure, thermal up to 20 MeV. So if we were to do that, um, that's all we would need to provide to it. And then if I look at the, the bins of this, so I print those out. Oh, whoops, I added a character at the end there. If I print those out, then it'll show me the groups of this energy filter. So the first one goes from zero to 0 0.01 EV, and the next one goes uh, from 0 0.01 EV to all the way up to 20 MeV. That was a good question. Thank you for that, appreciate it. All right, where were we? Let's see, so we did the tally. Okay, cool. Then we're going to go ahead and extract this tally. So the same as before, we'll say with an OpenMC object that's a state point file. We're going to grab that state point location that we got. And I'll just note that these are generally predictable. Um, the state point file is named based on the number of batches act the number of total batches in the simulation. So here ours is named state point dot 50. Um, but this just takes out any guesswork um, as to what the state point file name is using this method with the model object. So we'll do this and we'll say the spectrum tally is gonna be state point dot get tally. And what did we call that? We called it flux tally? Yeah, flux tally. And we'll say that the ID of the tally we extract from the state point file should match the flux tally ID that we gave to the simulation originally. Okay, so then here we're just gonna take the spect uh, flux spectrum, flux spectrum. It's just gonna be that spectrum mean And we'll just see the flux spectrum size overall. All right, so we have 70 values in, our, in the mean of this tally. We're not gonna dig in too much to like which value's which here right now, because they're always ordered by our energy. And we have one score. And now we can go ahead and plot our spectrum. So plot. That's the size that I wanted. Figure, oh, fig size. Oops. Size. Okay, so we're gonna specify a figure size. Be able to reuse some of this code in the next section, so. Uh, we will determine the bin boundaries. And then on our filter, we can get the lethargy bin width, which is really just the logarithmic width um, between each of these bins, but it'll just give us the ability to plot on a log scale really easily. So we'll use that for our X values in our plot. And then we're gonna plot a step function. Um, we're going to get the unique energy values from our energy filter. So we're taking, uh, when we looked at these bins, we're just gonna get all of those um, bin boundaries specifically. Uh, it should be step, not set. And then, because we're doing, we're gonna be doing a step plot. Step plot like this. So each value in the step plot is gonna have a place. So we need to kind of center that on the, on the value. 
So we don't need every single boundary, we need all but the last one, and that's kind of what this indexing is doing for us. And then again, we're gonna just flatten out that, uh, that array that we had and make sure to adjust it by the bin widths. We're gonna do a uh, semi-log plot. So we wanna make sure that we're looking at our energy spectrum and log scale, because it varies a huge number of orders of magnitude. Uh, and then let's just go ahead and do a couple of labels. Ah, next label. Flux. And we just want to note that this is really in, was a particle centimeter per source particle. And inevitably, issue NP, ah, I see. Uh, so when we imported the NumPy module, I should have imported NumPy as NP. That's a much more common way to see that module imported, so my mistake. And then, what did I call this? Something slightly different. Ah, flux spectrum, there we go. So a couple of issues there. One, I needed to import NumPy as NP so that I could call it here NP when I wanted to get the unique energy bounds. And then uh, I had spectrum instead of flux spectrum here for the tally mean. But once we got those two things corrected, now we can see our flux spectrum. And we, as we talked about, uh, or G1 introduced the model, it's a fast reactor, so we do expect this spectrum to look uh, a little bit harder or faster on the, on the energy regime. Okay, any questions on all of that? Extracting information and doing normalization. There is, uh, what is the unit of flux? Unit of flux. Ah, yes, yeah. so we're gonna talk about that a little bit as well. So this gets back into kind of our normalization. Uh, and to plot the flux with physical units, so looking at neutrons per centimeter squared per second as our flux, um, we need to do a normalization for the total neutron source, which is going to determine, or it is going to depend on the power in our reactor. So again, a really well-timed question uh, to segue into our tally normalization section. Um, but I think at this point. So before we dive into normalization, um, we're gonna go ahead and break, but before we do that, are there any thoughts or questions? Yeah. Into a text file? Um, yeah, so that is one thing that uh, is relatively easy to do with uh, the format that comes out of OpenMC. So looking at the flux, the flux spectrum and what it is, it's an array. So um, here we see, you know, most of our values are in the higher energy levels. Um, and this is a NumPy array. which gives you the ability to use some of the features. Uh, next. Should it be flux spectrum dot. Yeah, there we go. So um, we can save these to a text file. So we can say, let's see, the file name. So we could say, ah, uh, this is our fast flux. Flux spectrum dot T, txt. Got a 3D array instead, so we'll flatten that. So same thing uh, as before, this function of NumPy that we're using here that says save text. 
Uh, we're going to save this to a text file. And it just doesn't like the fact that we were providing an array that had more than one dimension. So we'll flatten it out, give it another go. And now if we look at the new file that was created, we can see all these values in a, in a text file. So this is kind of one of the advantages of working in like Python. We have all these capabilities in, in place that we can build on and leverage. Is there a follow-up? That's, yeah, that's correct. We could definitely, we could add in the, the energy values and print them out uh, pretty easily as well. And then if we look at our tallies.out file, is this? Okay, yeah, the flux is not in here. But yeah, we could definitely write out the energy, uh, the energy widths and bins when we do that too. Any questions in the chat, you want? No? Any other questions in the room? Oh yeah, one in the back. Uh, tutorials to locate what I'm sorry I mean I should maybe I should just come up Thank you. Uh, maybe I miss uh, for the tally uh, places uh, we take to these values from the one uh, cells or is there any uh, place specification for the tally taken, taking the tally values? Uh, so the, is the question, how do we get tally values for, for cells and for materials and things like that? Uh, yeah, so similar to the tally, um, or the energy filter that we applied to this tally, you can apply cell filters or material, material filters and then specify what cells go with those filters. So that will give you results that only apply to a certain material or only apply to a certain cell region. So uh, we cannot define any places or plane by to tally. For example, in the MCMP there is F-mesh tallies. Uh -huh. We can specify to location uh, that values to even if Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, there are, there are mesh tallies in... Oh, I see. Yeah, so the, the question was kind of, we can do cell and material tallies. What about things like mesh tallies? Yeah, where you have like a superimposed location uh, in the geometry. So in OpenMC, you can do mesh tallies as well. We have some examples of those in the notebooks uh, repo that I sent out. Um, so you can... You can do mesh tallies with a regular mesh or a cylindrical or spherical meshes, um, and then unstructured mesh also if you want to do like tetrahedral mesh. So. Right, yeah, that only applies to the tallies, not for the uh, geometry, right? Okay. Is that, yeah, okay. Yeah, no problem. There's a one more question. Like, yeah, uh, how can we get a more continuous flux spectrum instead of the discretized one you just showed? Like, by uh, choosing the more energy groups or? Yeah, I, I think that's the best answer is there's, so for the flux spectrum, you can get integrate, you can get values from Neutronics codes or from Monte Carlo codes that are integrated over the, with continuous energy, but to view the continuous flux, you kind of, you have to discretize it a little bit um, to be able to see it. So you could do more energy groups to get something that's more continuous would certainly be one way. There are also other uh, more complex tally types where you could get a continuous flux, but it's, uh, it's not terribly straightforward. So I think my best answer would be, yeah, like G1 said, to use more energy groups if you wanted a more continuous uh, flux representation. Are there any more questions in the chat or? Cool. Okay, well yeah, I think we're, um, we're a little early for the coffee break, but let's go ahead and, uh, and do that and then we'll resume at like 
315, 320, something like that. So 15, 20 minutes here, and uh, we'll come back. So thank you all.